Energy Media readers, we're going to be talking today to Amanda Hall, who is the CEO of Summit Nanotech, a Calgary-based clean tech company. And so welcome to the interview, Amanda. Thank you, Markham. Now, as I understand your company, Amanda, you uh, are a geo scientist by training and profession, and you worked in the industry uh, for a number of years uh, with uh, CNRL when I first met you. And you left CNRL and you developed this technology, this wonderful nanomembrane technology that I am, as I understand it, can strip lithium out of uh, sour water. And now you're commercializing it and it sounds like it's a great, great success. So kudos to you and all uh, on the wonderful work that you've done. Can you give us an overview of how you got started and, and what your technology does? Sure, for sure. Uh, so as you said, I've been in the oil and gas industry and in the mining sector for probably going on 13 years now. Um, I did a lot of potash mining before I got involved with oil and gas, which is why transitioning to lithium mining didn't seem like a big step to me because I had that mining background already. And in essence, uh, the when lithium is mined in South America, potash is mined at the exact same time. So it's part of a similar, a very similar process. The difference being that the mining I did was in Canada, in Saskatchewan, where there's not a lot of lithium. So very a different environment, but same kind of processes. Uh, so yeah, I, I was in oil and gas most recently, and I left, left my job there for a number of reasons. Uh, one of which was that I really was excited about the lithium sector and the lithium market and the hockey stick that I saw coming down the road. And I wanted to be involved in that, in that to some capacity. So I racked my brain trying to figure out all of the things that I had learned over my career path and trying to pull together pieces of, of the sciences that I'd learned, not just academically, but um, in, through experience as well, and see if I could come up with a way to solve some of the lithium mining problems that exist today. And there are a lot of them. So it, was, I didn't, it didn't take very long to find problems that needed solving. And uh, now we're at the phase where We've developed the technology to a point where we know how it works. Um, and so now we need to go into the market and find the perfect product market fit. So where does our technology best function along the whole lithium supply chain? So that's where we're at right now. And my understanding of your technology is that it's a membrane, correct? That's one piece of it. There are several steps in the process. Um, a lot of them are conventional steps that everyone's using, but there are two or three unique steps that are proprietary to us that nobody else is doing. And so that's what, that's the creative side of inventing is that you get to play with stuff that nobody's done before. And that's what gives you a marketable, patentable product at the end of the day. Now, my understanding is that you started out with doing this with produced water from oil and gas mines, and then now you're looking at maybe uh, some sour water uh, that's produced in South America. Can you give us a little background on that? Well, sour water is not a correct term necessarily because in South America, there's no gas and there's no oil in their brine. It's just clean salt water. There might be some solids that need to be filtered out before it. we run it through our membrane systems. Um, however, there's no messy hydrocarbons involved at all. So they do have other elements or other impurities that we need to be cognizant of, but there's, uh, yeah, it's not sour per se. The stuff we deal with in Canada or in Alberta or BC is, it could has, it has the potential to be sour, um, in which case we would have to do a previous preconditioning step where we take away any hydrocarbons or gases before we uh, apply our system to the brine. So it's just one extra processing step if we were operating in Canada. But we're starting off in South America because the lithium concentrations are much higher down there and there's bigger margins to be made and greater pain because production's already occurring. And so um, already producing lithium mines have uh, more, in, more um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're more interested in, in using new technologies to solve their problems than say an oil and gas producer where lithium recovery is more of a side project where it's no big deal, really. <laughs> gotcha, that's wonderful. And what are the, uh, what's the potential for developing or for implementing your technology down in, uh, down in South America? Is this, uh, are we gonna see Summit Nanotech become a very significant clean tech player there? Yes, absolutely. We're, we're creating a name for ourselves. It, it's really interesting because you get to a point in your uh, company build or your company marketing where 
people start to hear of you before you show up. So it's no longer a, hi, you don't know me, but this is what my company does. It's, hey, aren't you Amanda from Summit? <laughs> so it's kind of cool. We're developing a great reputation. Um, we're very heavy on our technology development. So we're coming forward with a business model and a strong technology that is something that the customer wants. And so that's a great position to be in uh, because they're asking us. We're not going begging necessarily for opportunities to pilot. They want us to come and show them what we can do to help. So it's a good opportunity for us. Can you explain to energy media readers, uh, maybe in a non-technical way and without uh, giving away any of your uh, intellectual property, but exactly what, how do you make a membrane out of, out of nanotechnology and what are the advantages? Ooh, that's a, that's a loaded question. We could talk for hours about that. <laughs> but uh, so making the membranes is, it's part of our proprietary um, secret sauce for our tech. So I can't go into a lot of detail about that, but um, needless to say, it's not your typical filtration membrane where it's just one homogenous uh, 2D, two-dimensional layer that, that it acts as a sieve. Uh, it has multiple layers. And so each layer performs a different function, whether it's stability or selectivity or protection. Sometimes you need protection too. So one of the biggest challenges with creating one of these lithium selective membranes is um, optimizing the selectivity but stabilizing the functionality of it as well. Stabilizing the, the physical stability of it so that with high pressures, higher pressures, temperatures, and kind of impure rough uh, feed solutions, you're not degrading the membrane. It's got to last a long time too. Like we want these membranes to last years. So we have to make sure that we're very careful with them and that we um, stabilize them the best way we can. Now, it sounds like the, you're able to engineer the materials for your membranes uh, to such a degree that you can, you can uh, achieve a precision that perhaps wasn't achievable before. Is that due to the materials that are available today that weren't available, you know, not that long ago? Yeah, absolutely. So there's these really cool new nanomaterials called metal organic frameworks, and they've changed the space really. Um, they're new-ish. Uh, I think they've been around a while, but they're new to the membrane space. Uh, traditionally, metal organic frameworks were used, they're, they're kind of a powder at first. You get them as a powder. So you can turn them into, um, you can turn them into something that you throw into a, a gas and it absorbs gas. So CO2 storage was actually, that was the first place I was introduced to metal organic frameworks were in their use of gas absorption. Um, but then we realized over the last couple of years that you can impregnate, impregnate membranes with them and they still function in a way that is uh, special and unique, but they're in a, on a two dimensional surface now instead of just a powder that acts as an absorbent. Now, one of the things I like about your company is that uh, you had some a very interesting experience with a major competition early on in the life of your of your little firm, and and you won. You came out, and I think uh, Margaret Atwood was was one of the the judges. I mean, this was fairly prestigious. Can you walk us through uh, what the contest was and and your experience there? Absolutely. Yeah, it was a game changer for us because without that grant. We wouldn't have a company. Uh, we would, we'd be struggling right now though. So it was called the Women in Clean Tech Challenge and it was put on by Enercan and Mars. Um, and it, it basically opened up national wide. You had to be Canadian, you had to identify as a female and you had to have a clean technology company. And so I applied, having met all three of those criteria and I won a position in the top six. Uh, so. It's a two and a half year contest now for the six finalists to uh, vet against each other to commercialize our technology to the point where um, we, we all started at different places too. Like some of the companies I'm competing against were way further along than I was when I started. And so we're, we're kind of mapping out our commercialization process over a two and a half year period. And whoever does the best over that two and a half year period wins a million dollar prize. And it's not equity based. It's, there's no strings attached. It's just cold, hard cash. <laughs> so it's fantastic because uh, that, again, will go a long way. Um, but what it also gave me was access to a government lab. So our prototype is in the government lab in Devon, Alberta, um, and training on how to be a CEO. Because when you're a science geek and you start a company, you really don't know what you're doing. So, um, so Mars put, us in, put all six of us in an incubator, and they're slowly teaching us how to be CEOs 
how to put our, uh, our product uh, commercialization plan in place and our business models in place and how to grow the company in a really um, well thought out methodical way that is pr proven to be successful in other arenas. So it should work for clean tech too. Plus I get tons of mentorship, uh, which is great. And I get identified as a leading female innovator nationally. So I can go outside of Canada and say, I'm a Canadian leading female innovator, so pay attention to me. <laughs> and often they do. <laughs> so, so that's well, that's, been that's terrific. And congratulations on, on your win. Now, uh, for those uh, readers who aren't familiar, of course, lithium is a primary component in lithium ion batteries. And with all of the uh, battery storage that's accompanying electri electrification of transportation, as well as battery storage for utilities and other applications, uh, I think everybody is expecting a huge increase in the market for lithium over the next, say, five or 10 years. And that sounds like it bodes really well for your future. It certainly does. Yeah, the lithium marketplace is, it's experiencing a bit of a lull right now. Lithium prices have come down a fair bit from where they were maybe five years ago. Um, but we're nearly at the bottom. They're calling it bottom very soon. And then it's going to ramp up. And because we're tracking very closely with electric vehicle markets and electric vehicle sales, we, we see a hockey stick coming and especially for renewable energy storage too, because that's getting more and more popular. I think in the US alone, there's like an $8 trillion budget for renewable energy infrastructure. So lithium ion batteries and solid state storage is part of that projection as well. Amanda, thank you very much for this. We really appreciate it. This is a great Canadian success story and uh, all the luck to you and your company in the future. And we'll, uh, we'll track your little company. I hope to have you back for another interview when you're a medium size or a larger company. <laughs> that would be great. Thanks so much, Markham. That was fun. Thank you.